Hi everybody. Christmas time. So I'm going to don my Christmas hat and we are going to dive into some silky science. So let's go. So if I keep this down enough, my bobble doesn't go above the green screen, but at least it adds a little bit of fun because that's what we're going to be having. Over the next 10 minutes or so, I'm going to inspire you about a bit of silky science. So my name's Chris. I'm a academic at the Material Science and Engineering Department at the University of Sheffield. And what we're going to be talking about today is these things. So. You probably have seen them at the bottom of your garden. They may be covered in frost at the moment, but these are spiderwebs. This is one of nature's most impressive materials. And what we're going to be exploring is why is it so impressive? What's the material science behind it? And how is it made? So, silk. It's not just made by spiders. It is also made by silkworms, bees, even ants will make silk. And they use this fiber for a range of different purposes outside of their body. So they can be using it for ballooning as spiderlings fly off into the uh, jet stream. They can use it for protection of themselves as they transform into from a, from a silkworm to a silk moth. They can use it for catching their dinner. Uh, spiders creating webs or they can be using it like bees to protect their young but because silk has evolved so many times independently in nature it's been quite difficult for us to say exactly what it is so we've had to come up with this general definition silks being structural proteins different to enzymes that you may have heard of because these do mechanical roles they are spun into fibers and importantly they are used outside of the body so wind rain sunshine they are having to perform which is very similar to the way in which we use our materials but the master of spin is the spider. The spider will produce up to seven different types of silk, each from a specialized gland inside it, with each having a very specific role in its web, from the structural silk of the dragline to the swathing silk that it uses to wrap up its prey. But when we look at it from a material science perspective, we find out that their material properties are all different and they are unique to that type of silk. So much so that you could give me a piece of silk, I could put it in one of my tensile testers that we're going to explain in a second and I could probably tell you what type of silk it was used for in the web because nature is amazing at matching its material properties to its function. As material scientists that's exactly what we do when we're asked to make choices and to match material properties to natural function. Well, how do we go about testing silk? Well, this was filmed a few years ago now for the BBC. This is uh, Gem Stansfield very carefully putting weights onto a single silk fibre and he got to about three grams before it was just about to break. This is a silk fibre ten times thinner than a human hair. Look how much it's stretched and then it falls apart. But the type of test that he's doing in this video is essentially applying a force to a fibre and measuring how much it stretches. And that is known as a tensile test. So this is a bit of learning that you're going to be doing today. We're going to tell you the difference between stress and strain. Strain being extensibility, how far something deforms. Stress being strength, so how much force does it require to uh, stretch it that far, how much load or how much weight can hang off it. And we create these things called stress strain graphs. So we'll take a fibre, we'll stretch it and stretch it and stretch it in the x-axis and we'll measure the force required to do that in the y. You can have a go at doing this if you want, there's a virtual uh, tensile tester over at Flashy Science that you are more than welcome to have a go at. You take that fibre, you stretch it and stretch it and stretch it, 
and you get a range of different mechanical properties. And these mechanical properties give you all sorts of useful information about how much energy it can absorb before it breaks, which is toughness. The stiffness of a fiber, which is its initial um, uh, sort of gradient before it yields the breaking point. That's when the fiber finally fails. And you can have a go all of this at flashyscience.com, experiments, materials, tensile light, if you wanted to have a go yourself at pulling apart things and doing tensile tests at home. But what about the lab? How do we do it in the lab? Well, in the lab, I'm going to give you a bit of a history lesson. So these three things are floppy disks. You can ask your parents. They may remember the uh, blue one. They'll certainly remember the red and maybe even your grandparents might remember the black one. But basically, when we didn't have tensile testers and we first wanted to start asking material properties about silk, we had to build these material testing devices, these tensile testing devices ourselves. So. We did that. Uh, uh, this was an example of something that I made 15 years ago. I made it out of a floppy disk drive because I'm not that old. Uh, but the real advances came from a modification a few years earlier than that to the hard disk that you've been waiting for, $3,400 for 10 megabytes of storage, one camera phone photo now, and that created a silk testing device of which we know a lot about the amazing properties of spider silk purely because of tests done on that instrument there. Absolutely incredible stuff. And by doing tensile tests, we're able to compare two different types of fibers because stress is normalized for the cross-sectional area, the size of the material that you're testing into it. And when everything's put on a fair and even playing scale, what we playing field, what we see is that wool and silkworm silk, natural fibers are relatively okay, but the really impressive one is spider dragline silk, and that's because it has a combination of strength and toughness that we cannot seem to replicate, which is absolutely incredible. Now, if we were to compare this to a higher performance fiber, such as Kevlar, what we find is Kevlar is very, very stiff, but it isn't as tough as spider silk. So you can make a bulletproof vest out of spider silk. It would be lighter, it would be thinner than a Kevlar bulletproof vest. The only problem is it would stop the bullet about two meters behind you because in order for that spider silk to absorb the energy, it has to stretch. So perhaps not great for personal protection, but you will find it potentially useful for a whole range of other types of protective devices. So we know that silk has this amazing combination that material science can't quite uh, copy yet. So I spend a lot of my time looking and trying to understand how do spiders make silk. I stare at them intently and what I actually end up doing is I get to know them. And as I get to know these spiders, I look at their anatomy. And as I look at their anatomy, I get to understand know what's going on inside them. And obviously this is how I initially started labelling what a spider looks like when I began my research. I've come to love them now. They're absolutely amazing uh, things and I look at how silk is spun. So if I'm looking at how silk is spun, it's not quite as simple as this. I made it with my bum, but you may be surprised that silk is made inside the animal. It is stored as a liquid, and just through the act of pulling it through a specially shaped tube, it transforms into a solid fiber, and that makes it quite different to a lot of other types of biological materials, such as hair, bone, and feathers, because these things are grown slowly over months and years and years and years they will form into their final shapes. Silks are defined by their processing and they are spun, which is something that we do industrially when we spin our fibres. So there's a lot that we can learn from how silk is made. And this is a brilliant example of just how fast uh, silk can be produced on demand. This is a spider actively wrapping up its prey. Milliseconds ago, that was a liquid and it's transformed into a really impressive solid fiber. So if we can learn from that, we can improve the way in which we make our own fibers potentially. But I told you a fib earlier on in this 
talk, I said that these are the properties of spider silk. Well, what we now know as well is that just by changing the spinning speed, changing the conditions in which this material is processed, it is possible to create a fiber with properties anywhere within this range. So really, really useful from both a material property and a material processing perspective. So the next time that you see a spider web at the bottom of your garden, if you're venturing outside at Christmas time, have a look at a spider web and just think it's not just the material itself, but how it's processed that could lead to a lot of future inspiration. So thank you very much for your attention and I hope you've enjoyed this talk. Thanks very much.